All right, here we go. Clap one. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-host, S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? Great. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, a little on edge because we are right in the middle of a hockey game that has just gone into overtime. <laughs> Why do we plan these records at the worst possible times for you? But neither are my team so i shouldn't care as much but i've gone so deep that after the team that i was really hoping would win lost i <laughs> and it's just down to the final two i grumpily said to my family it doesn't even matter who wins i don't even care anymore wow and then the first game came on and i was on the edge of my seat and i was like i know who i want to win and so i've just been it's 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 consumed my life, maybe in the it. best way. I can't tell. I've come alive, is the point. And I even though it. they aren't my team, I would like to see Vegas take it. I've been hearing a lot of buzz, a lot of busy buzzy about um, Vegas because it's an underdog tale, right? Yes, you could say that. I didn't want them to win it. I, I, I wanted the team that they played to be where vegas is now got it i just those boys were in my heart <laughs> and i just really thought i'm I'm not a dallas fan but watching dallas throughout the playoffs i became one and i was like i would love to see them in the finals and and they were not and i was very crushed by that right but i'm doing my best and i've bounced back and it's now tied and going into overtime which makes me ill wow i just don't like overtime because if you get scored on in regular time you can come back i can delude myself for 20 minutes and say oh, you can come back yep but in overtime you don't get that so yeah. i'm uh sick about it and just giving the old refresh on the app because now i have a sports app which you're I really in it it's yeah it's it's next level i mean i love it i'm all for it yeah it's look it's the it's the gift i didn't expect to get this year but i've already been shopping for new gear for the for the fall season but i know they're gonna bring out new stuff so i just need to be patient new gear. I might like the new stuff new gear yeah I'm not gonna let you walk past that one you can't just you can't just drop new gear and then not yeah. get into like what you're talking about here. You're talking yeah. like merch. I am talking merch. I'm talking, I'd like at least a hat and uh, I, I'd like a jersey, probably a hoodie, maybe a t-shirt. What I'm we'll hearing see. is a lot of gear. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. 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 Look, I already have a hat. It'll be fine, but I'd like... I'd like a new one because I've had that one for uh, quite a long time. And I I have a Flyers jersey, but uh, it's it's one of the blank ones at the back. I'd like one with, with a specific player on it, but I don't know who yet. Mm. Because Maybe wait to see the new talent. Right? Yeah. Thank you for that. I like that. Yeah. I'm going to wait to see the new talent and I'm going to wait to see the new gear. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, listen, I couldn't be happier. I mean, again, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to say I'm shocked. I'm not. Um, but I just like that it's escalating. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's pretty much on schedule for me though, for yeah. how I escalate with things that, I mean, uh, for quick example, off the top of my head, mini brands. Sure. That goes from zero to 60 in 0.5 seconds. Like Absolutely. I'm, I'm there. Uh, I get in, I commit according to that teen girl magazine the quiz we took in like 1994 i still am to this day too quick to commit yeah what i, what I love was uh, that was like a core moment for you like we took this quiz and christy got too yeah. quick to commit and i remember it like it felt like that was a life moment like it was it because you. i i had never been so insulted 
it was the first time I want I said 94. I want to say it was probably closer to like 97, 98. Yeah. Um, but it was the fir- first moment in my life that I had to look inside. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was the first one where I looked at it and went, I looked at myself and I didn't like what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> that Cosmopolitan magazine was holding a mirror up and you yeah. didn't want to see it. Correct. Yeah. Look, what I wouldn't give to find that quiz again. Because I'd like yeah. to retake it, but I know I'd I know I'd be throwing it the whole time to purposely get that I'm not too quick to commit. The thing is, I know that I am. <laughs> I'm too quick to commit. I know that. Understood. Yeah. Listen, I mean, there's no judgment here. I am no. absolutely the same way. Yeah. So, it's part of know. it's part of our bond. It's part of our bond. We get into things. Yep. Very quickly. Yep. And then we need everything. Yep. Like I find an author that I like, I read one of their books and then I'm like, well, obviously I need to read everything. Yeah. And then I find out they've written like 10, 15 and I'm like, well, it's going to be a long week. You just to go for it. You do. And you know, for me too, it's, it's not only that, but it's also that I then take it to a level that feels ridiculous. Sure. You know, that's what I do. Well, I think it's part of your charm. Well, I mean, did I have 500 CD copies of my single printed? Yes, I did. Physical copies. Physical copies. Was it like you had to have a certain number? Yeah. Okay. Well, see, that makes sense then. Yeah. I would not have ordered that many. If there was a lower tier, I probably would have gone with that. But now the good news is I've got about 440 of them still. (laughs) You know? Mm -hmm. But I think I may have mentioned this before, or it may have been on a bonus episode, but I I can't physically figure out. This is the one piece I don't know yet. How do I get these to Amazon? Sure. And then they get, then they send them out. I know there's an answer to that question, but I just haven't gotten there yet. It's oh, been yeah. a busy there week. There has to be like yeah. a, they have a service that is like the opposite of when they deliver a package. They just pick one up and then it somehow goes back to them and it goes from there. I don't know. I think I have to send them stock, but then I'm like, where do you to. send it to? I mean, I don't know, but, but I may or may not have some upcoming gigs planned. Cause I'm in a band. And uh, so I can also just sell them at my merch table. And I know what people are thinking. Who wants a CD into that? I say, it's a very pretty coaster. Well, also right? you want a CD. I'll send you one. Of course. I'll, yeah. I'll send you 10. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you're going to find a lot of people who want it. You're we'll going to find a lot of interest. We'll see. We'll see. Either way. Either way. When does this air? This airs next week. I have it written down. Doesn't matter. It's not important. June 13th. So, well, listen, dear listeners, this is relevant to my journey currently. That is the day that the Billboard charts come out. That's the day. That's the day in question. So if you're listening to this, when you're finished the episode, Go well, don't bother. There's a lot to, to wade through on the billboard site. Come to my social media because I'm sure if I've made it, I'll be screaming from the mountaintops. And if I haven't, just don't bring it up. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm very proud of how well the song has done so far. It's been blowing me away. It's wild. You should be proud. Thank it's you. an incredible accomplishment. It is. Again, like we're saying, I again, we take it all the way. All right, yeah. you know. I, I certainly, I certainly have taken this to a level that has involved, you know, more elements than I think most would. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I would almost say that we are very all or nothing. Yeah. But we're never nothing. <laughs> we're never nothing. Because if, if we, if we set our mind to it, we're like, well, we have to go all the way. Yeah. And then there can be times where it'll be like, oh, maybe I'll phone this in. Never happening. It won't mm-hmm. happen. We always say we're going to phone it in for the sake of time or whatever, but then we're like, nope. Yep. Find the time elsewhere. Yep. Exactly. I, uh, I, I also should say, I guess we haven't talked about this on the show yet. I I did have a single release party in LA. Um, 
Uh. which was incredible. And I had a backdrop behind me on the stage. I had a giant um, like banner, like an eight by eight backdrop where people could take their picture in front of it. I had a table of merch with t-shirts and the CDs. Um, I had stickers that said VFIP, very fucking important person, which I thought I like was great. Um, yeah. uh, for people coming in. And my mom had flown in for the party. Shout out to yeah. Mother Laurel. And I got her a t-shirt made because her job for that party was to run the merch booth. So her shirt said merch mom. And did she ever thrive? Oh, I watched her at one point in my home digging through boxes of hundreds of t-shirts, sorting them by size and color. And she turned to me and she said, you know who else would like this job? Christy. <laughs> because as we've established, yeah, especially in the last year, yep. That's my future. Yep. That's, uh, yeah, her and I are so much alike. It's yep. frightening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Th these two with their lists and me running, chasing after a leaf. You know, that's basically the dichotomy. Um, but yeah, it was so fun. And then the other part of this I have to share, obviously, for the, for the, for the dear listeners, for the OGs especially, is that, of course, our favorite band of all time is Age of Electric, Canadian mm -hmm. band. And uh, I needed a guitar player. I tip out my usual guitar player. Usual. I mean, we've recorded music together and played one other show. Usual. Doesn't matter. Uh, he I'm wasn't sorry, available. Is it the guy that's on your single? Yeah. Then it's your usual guitar it's, player. I guess it's my one of my usual guitarists. There you go. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't available. And so I thought, I'm going to see if if Todd Kearns, lead singer of, of Age of Electric, bass player with Slash, you know, extremely talented musician mm -hmm. uh if he's available and he absolutely was and he played that show and what a wild dream come true standing yes. on stage singing the song that i had wrote living my dream of being a rock star beside the guy who was the lead singer and guitarist of my favorite band of all time that's insane it's insane you know what i mean i've done it i did there i, I think i crossed across a lot of dreams off the list with that Oh, it's impressive as hell. I am impressed you were, I mean, I'm not surprised, but I am impressed you were able to do it because I, I, I had a tough time being in his presence. It's, him once. I it mean, was, listen, I didn't, I, I literally, my knees gave out as he left the room <laughs> and I held on to a table really quickly, but then he circled back really quick and came in the room so I had to prop myself back up to act like I was fine so I was one of those toys where you push the bottom and its little legs go I was one <laughs> I was one of those you crumpled you crumpled I did I yeah. I fully did because I he came in we spoke I acted like everything was totally normal and then he left and my legs came and then yeah. he quickly came back in and I was just like hey yeah I'm great just a quick lean you need something no you're good okay <laughs> again great meeting you oh my god and then my legs went again it was i couldn't be on a stage anywhere near what he does his his presence there's a glow absolutely and yeah it's uh it's like the sun well listen yeah shout out to 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 him and to that night it was truly just such a joy i also had my friend uh taryn killam uh, come and be my MC because I didn't have an opening act and I thought it would sure. be funny if he would come and like do a character and so he came up with this character named Chip Chubley who is a self-described quote sound guru and he just did the funniest bit and it was he was like are you comfortable with a light roasting and I'm like I'm comfortable with a pretty intense roasting um and <laughs> he I don't want to quote it because I'm going to mess it up but it was something along the lines of like some people would say embarking on a music career at age 40 could be impractical <laughs> <laughs> I just died. <laughs> it was such a great bit. It was so funny. It was such a great night. Truly just such a joy. So anyway, let's see. Let's see what happens. Uh, see what happens when this episode comes out. And then, of course, stay tuned because not long after that, you know what's going on pre-sale? The next single. <gasps> there she goes. And that's the pop punk cover of Umbrella, which I cannot wait for people to hear. Had you announced that before? I announced it at the show. Okay, so I but felt like none of us were at the show. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but I Except felt like for Anessa, like... who I assume is listening and was at the show. Yes, 100%. There's some crossover. Uh, Mother Laurel, right. uh, friend oh, of the podcast, of Anessa yep. Frantowski, friend of the podcast, uh, Leslie Seiler. Um, so there's at least three people that crossover. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> I just like that you said it so casually. I thought there would be like a big dramatic well, reveal, yeah, but I like that a lot. You know, I think because I said it there, I was like, well, and there were some videos that some people posted of, of us doing the song live. Sure. So I was like, oh, it's out there. I guess I should have given it some more fanfare. I was just surprised that you were like, this is what it's going to be. And and I was just like, are we telling people? We. Uh, it's just because I this. knew. You're in was... this with me. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll take that. Look, was well, it the two that? of us sitting at a hockey game where I turned to you and went, would Brianna be fun? Yep. Again, always comes back to hockey. It always, well, it does. It does for you currently. Um, it does. But- Speaking of that, but absolutely nothing to do with it. What you drinking over there? Uh, Well, currently I'm doing a water and a Slurpee. Yeah. Uh, But you and I chatted before hitting record long enough that I think at the break, I'm going to get a Mike's Lime. I love that for you. I have a watermelon sugar high noon. I'm really trying to make that. (laughs) I I don't know. Like they just are. But if they, if, but if they use it without crediting you. Enraged, enraged. I will be inconsolably enraged. And we have the receipts and the timestamps and dates to prove. Oh, I'll take that to court. I'll take that to court, baby. I love the product. Guess what? Not loving it enough not to sue. What I'm I in America. Is- it's, it's it's the land of litigation. What a monster I am that I was like, oh, then we're going to absolutely do an episode about that. I think it really is only a matter of time before there's something we're embroiled in that ends up, it's like a snake eating its tail. Like, it's like, you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, there was a comment. I don't know. I can't really remember. My brain is all over the place, but uh, something happened. My husband said something uh, in a teasing way and I didn't care for it. And I was like, you better watch yourself. Because I have a true crime podcast and I know what not to do. And he was like, uh, it was something about like, you know, I'd never get away with it. And I was like, I also couldn't handle it because every other true crime podcast would be like, well, it would be hit news. The host, like the co-host of a true crime podcast embroiled in the potential murder of her own husband. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I would be more annoyed at seeing the other podcasts doing my story that would annoy me more than anything yeah now in this world are you in prison for this or oh no i've obviously gotten away with it of course of course and the kids and i are living under assumed names uh with matt leblanc possibly in cuba (laughs) cuba i don't know cuba was the first uh thought I don't know. It's, we're going to have to go foreign. We're going to have to go somewhere outside of uh, Canada. Unless I go like J-Lo in The Mother and just go right to Alaska. I, I don't have... think I'd fare well in Alaska. Oh, I don't think that's for you. I have um, not watched that movie yet. We don't, we just watched it last night, which is why it's fresh. Got it. And fresh what were your thoughts? Google. Um, I, I spent much of the movie going, ooh, that cop's attractive. Uh, and much of it going, oh, God, the daughter's annoying. Uh, let the bad man have her already. Oh, my God. Uh, like, she was just too much. And I was like, I would not put up with that. But um, I I like seeing J-Lo kick ass. I do. Yeah. I love You know her. what J-Lo I... film I love? I Enough. can't wait. Enough. Did you we, ever see that? We referenced it multiple times last night yeah, yeah. i want to revisit that now granted maybe it won't hold up but i was, i saw that in the theater in high school that does yeah and i That's... kept saying she's had enough oh the amount of times last night that one of us would turn to the other and go oh she's had enough <laughs> because well, you know what you know what an amazing badass. what an amazing career for her though still going in high school she was doing that movie oh. she's still doing them now god bless good for her yeah, because was she started as like a, wasn't she? Are they were they called the Fly Girls? Correct. She started as a Fly Girl, and now she's just a Fly Girl. I nope. I want to. You know stop what? Myself. It's okay. It's okay. Don't fight it. No. Don't fight it. No, she's stunning. Uh, she was then. She is now. And what a hell of a career! Also, full yeah. circle because it it feels like the time in which 
she was it was around the time that she was getting with Ben Affleck and now she's with Ben Affleck again. It feels like she's in some sort of time loop. Interesting. Now, look, do I have certain theories about the potential of time travel? I do. We used to talk about it on the show more. All I'm saying is this. Is it possible in the not so distant future? Yeah. She was like, I have to change the history of time. I need to be with Ben. Like, is it future her coming back and being like, I have to do anything? And they were like, okay. But again, when you change the course of time, it can have ripples. Maybe that's why all these forest fires are happening. First of all, I want you to know that I can't even think of what movie or TV show I'm thinking of. But if you're going to start talking about time travel, I want to fold a piece of paper into multiple squares and push a pen through it to show you that's how time travel works (laughs) with wormholes. I don't remember what that's from, what I'm referencing, uh, but it makes me feel smart in the world of time travel. But I need to believe that uh, time travel is going to be a thing. I need to believe it. Do you need to or do you want to? (laughs) That's how it spells. I absolutely, I absolutely want to. I do too. I mean, uh, but I'm very, like, my heart has always been with Quantum Leap. Sam Beckett, forever. Um, uh, There's a lot of episodes they made that couldn't be made today. But, (laughs) it's not the point. The point is, um, I've always wanted to believe that that kind of thing was, was possible. That yeah. someone could go in, maybe not specifically leap into another person. Because every time I was like, I feel bad for that person because they wouldn't have any memory of that day. You know what I'd love to see? Yeah. Let's see a reimagining where you see the person just after he's left their body. Do they have any memory of it? Is it like on Supernatural where they are aware of what's going on, but they're not in the driver's seat? Oh, I would hate that. Yeah, that's bad. That feels like a nightmare. They yeah. did remake the show. Yes. There is a current one. I have not seen it. I haven't either. Just but I don't know. It's strong, strong love of Scott Bakula that I uh yeah. I just haven't been able to. I get that. But uh but look, I'll I may circle back at some point and give it a shot. I'm in the I'm clean I'm doing some house cleaning, one may say, and I'm going through and watching shows that I had that I stopped partway through and didn't finish off. So I finished off uh, the show Claws, which I loved um, because I love Niecy Nash. And I just got back into Carnival Row. I didn't know you were into it to begin with. Yes, but see, that's the thing. The first season was like three to five years ago. Oh, right. And it's just kind of been hanging there in like a, is it coming back? We're coming back, but later... And they just, within the last few months-ish, I think, brought out the second season. And I was like, should I rewatch the first season? I'm sure it'll be fine. They gave me a very healthy previously. Uh, So that helped. I probably should have rewatched the first season again. But I'm in it. I I mean, you also get a lot of zoom-ins on Orlando Bloom that I don't hate. Yeah. So... I'm I'm invested. I'm back in. So this was the, I love it. the best move. So I'm just going to, you know, keep doing the cleanup. And maybe in that cleanup, I'll have to do, uh, oh, new Quantum Leap's going to have to take a number. Take because a number. I'd also, I'd also like to get through Justified. And then there's only murders in the building, which I'd like to try. And There's so much TV. It's a lot of TV to watch. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. Well, listen. On that note, we're going to be talking about a documentary uh, that was on TV. Um, I, for the record, I have a wonderful trifecta of doom. I got a Diet Coke over here. I've got a Tangerine LaCroix. And of course, my Watermelon Sugar High Noon. I just had to uh, make sure that everyone knew about the threesome of drinks. Um, uh, And I also just want to say, uh, I I brought up the forest fires. I'm not suggesting that J-Lo actually caused the forest fires with with her time travel. I want to make sure that's clear. And I also want to make it clear uh, that we obviously wish all the best to everyone who's being impacted by those. It's wild. It's a wild time in Canada. It's a wild time. I know in, place in the, places in the U.S. too, the air quality is unbelievable. It looks like Armageddon out there. So please stay safe and stay healthy and um, 
you know, do everything we need to do. And I really hope that this is over soon. I mean, it's it's wild for me because I live in a place where we usually have an annual fire season where right. it's always there's a drought. Everything's dry. Um, of course, over the past you know, six months, we've gotten so much rain in the LA area that I think, knock wood, we're going to bypass fire season because everything is so lush, which is a gift and a blessing. Mm -hmm. um, but never did I think that then the opposite coast, like it really feels like, you know, the opposite side of the, the I don't know, what would we call it, the continent um, is now having the the same, the same issue uh, that we had before. Yeah. And I know how scary it is and all of the above. So just sending out uh, lots of love to everyone who's impacted by that. When is uh, the L.A. season? Is that like a September? Yeah. Ish? Yeah. I want to say, I want to say fall. Usually we start to get a little bit of rain in, in the winter or historically in like November, December, there'll be some rain. So right. then it's over by then. But yeah, I think it's like September, October. I mean, August is so hot here. Again, historically, things are shifting. Um but to, it's like, you know, I feel like back home, for example, it's like July is like the peak of heat. And here it's no, it's August, September, in my experience. Fair. Yeah. yeah. Things because uh, I'm I'm next door to uh, where fires are happening. Um, but here it's been like quite hot lately. Right. Which at this time, it's not usually that hot yet, but that's just where we're at now. Yeah. We were talking oh, yeah. the other day about how, like, when we were kids, 20, it was, I'm talking Celsius, of course, but it was, like, a nice day in the summer. It was, like, 18, 20. Yeah. And now it's, like, it was 25 at 9 the other morning. And I was, like, here we go. It's going to be 39 by the end of the day. It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a but lot. And it's going to really turn and go completely the other way. Probably September. So we take yeah. what we can get. Listen, we're all just doing our best at the end of the day. So, of course, this week's episode is based on the Netflix documentary. It is Netflix, right? I think so. I think so. Uh, but the documentary is called House of Maxwell. This is, of course, uh, the family of Jelaine Maxwell, who you may or may not have heard of uh, <laughs> over the last few years. Um, but regardless, we're going to give you a little bit of background about this, get you up to speed right now. On the surface, Robert Maxwell seemed like the epitome of a true rags to riches story. After losing his entire family in the Holocaust, Robert escaped to Britain, where he became a war hero, a member of parliament, and a self-made millionaire with a media empire. But after his suspicious death in 1991, it was discovered that Robert was billions of dollars in debt and that the money was missing and that money was missing from his company's pension fund. And yet somehow, Robert is not the biggest scandal in the Maxwell family, as his youngest daughter, Jelaine, was arrested on charges of grooming minors and sex trafficking. So join us as we deep dive the Maxwell family, looking into the fraud, trials, and allegations of one of the richest families in the world. One family, 50 years of scandal, and two spicy podcast hosts ready to drop it like it's hot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't see it coming. Wow. Yeah, sometimes those are the last thing I write. I when I'm in a quick in like, oh, I've got to send it to her. And then sometimes it's the first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you never know what you're gonna get. But that's where we're gonna get that. Oh god, I'm probably gonna say so many of these words wrong. Ah <sighs> cause I should have looked this over before <laughs> because I wrote it a week ago. Because I am so deep into something else already that I don't remember what we're about to talk about. Listen, Ernie that's always my favorite time. So a disclaimer, as always, uh, this episode will contain mentions of suicide, sexual assault, and child exploitation. So trigger warning for those who need it. Robert Maxwell was born Jan Ludwig Hyman Binyamin Hawk. Wow. On June 10th, 1923 in Czechoslovakia, which for the geog ge geography, geography buffs, uh, 
split into Czech Republic and Slovakia in December 1992. Uh, the specific region that Robert was born in is now Solot Solotvino, Ukraine. Um, even though he didn't technically go by Robert yet, I'm going to keep calling him Robert for the sake of consistency because otherwise it's madness. Yeah. And I'm barely holding it together as it is, it seems. So Robert was one of seven children born to Mikhail Hawk and Hannah Slomowitz, who were both poor farm workers. At age 17, Robert joined the Czechoslovak army to help defend against the occupation of Germany against or during World War II. After the fall of France, Robert, who was using the name Ivan de Maurier, enlisted as a private in the British army. Five years later, Robert had risen to the rank of captain and had even been awarded the Military Cross for storming a German machine gun nest. Sadly, every member of Robert's family died in the Holocaust, so when the war was over, Robert moved to the UK, where he became a British citizen. Two years later, he legally changed his name to Ian Robert Maxwell. Now, before I get into his private life, I have to mention the fact that the Foreign Office, which is part of the UK government that deals with foreign affairs, believed that Robert Maxwell was a secret agent. Not only did Robert have links to the British Secret Service, MI6, he also had ties to the Israeli intelligence service, Mossad, and to the Soviet KGB. Six leaders from Mossad even attended Robert's funeral, which we will get into shortly. The Israeli prime minister at the time was also in attendance, and he gave Robert's eulogy, saying, quote, he has done more for Israel than can be told today. Robert allegedly helped smuggle airplane parts into Israel during the Palestine War in 1948, which helped to lead to an Israeli victory. But as for his personal life, in September 1944, Robert met Elizabeth Maynard, known as Betty, who was working as a translator for the Welcome Committee, which introduced British, British soldiers to people in France. The couple were married in March 1945, and over the next 16 years, the couple would have nine children. Wow! Now, after the, the double episode of the Murdochs, where there was just so many family and trying to keep them straight, I thought, this is going to be nice. Going in with a smaller family, and then first day, learned he had nine kids. That was, that's a lot. So there was Michael in 1946, Philip in 1948, Anne in 1949, twins Christine and Isabel in 1950, Corrine in 1953, Ian in 1956, Kevin in 1959, and Jelaine in 1961. Now, out the gate, I know her name could be said many ways. And I will do my best to stick to one for the sake of consistency. I've heard it Jelaine. I've heard Galaine. I've heard it so many ways. I'm going to try and stick with Jelaine just for consistency. Accuracy, we don't care. We don't give a shit about Jelaine. No, we and, absolutely and do not. And her feelings. So that's, uh, that's that. So, sadly... Two of the Maxwell children died quite young. In 1957, Corrine, who was the youngest daughter at the time, died from leukemia at just three years old. And then in 1961, the oldest child, Michael, was in a car accident in which his driver fell asleep at the wheel and hit another car head on. Michael, who was just 15 at the time, fell into a coma. He never regained consciousness and died six years later at the age of 21. I will get into more of the other Maxwell siblings later in the story. I'm gonna currently focus uh, on Robert. After the war, Robert used the contacts he had made to get into the publishing business, first becoming the UK and US distributor for a series of scientific books. In 1951, Robert was able to buy 75% of a small publisher which would be renamed Pergamon Press. 
There, then as a member of the Labour Party, Robert was elected as a member of Parliament for Buckingham in 1964. He served in the role until 1970. In 1969, Robert attempted to buy the newspaper News of the World. However, the family who owned it said they didn't like the idea of a non-Brit owning their paper, saying it was a British paper run by British people and it would stay that way. So did they really dislike non-Brits or was there an issue with the fact that Robert was an immigrant? I don't know. Maybe they just didn't like Robert as a person and the British thing was an excuse. Because that same year, Rupert Murdoch bought News of the World. He also purchased The Sun, which is another paper that Robert had previously tried to purchase. Um, to be clear, Robert Murdoch is Australian. So they didn't want, they said, no, we won't sell it to Robert Maxwell because he's not British, but then sold it to an Australian. That's weird. So questions there. But yeah, uh, Rupert Murdoch would go on to build a media empire and become one of the richest men in the world. He also became Robert's nemesis as Robert would spend the rest of his life trying to compete with Rupert's success. Starting with the establishment of the Maxwell Foundation in 1970 and the purchase of British Printing Corporation in 1981, which would later become Maxwell Communication Corporation. Then in 1984, Robert bought the Mirror Group, which published six newspapers, including the Daily Mirror and the Scottish Daily Record. Robert said the editors would be free to produce the news without interference. One journalist claimed he was able to prove that the new boss was a liar and a crook. And then somehow that same journalist ended up being on Robert's side and even wrote Robert's authorized biography. So it's amazing what power and influence can do. As the chairman for Oxford United, Robert saved the football club from bankruptcy in 1982. Four years later, the team won the League Cup. Robert tried to also buy Manchester United in 1984, but he refused to pay full asking price. So the deal just never happened. Now, around this time, the Mirror Group had a video game and software division called Mirrorsoft, which had published a game called Spitfire 40, which is apparently a real hit in the UK. But then Mirrorsoft got into a battle with Nintendo over the distribution rights to a new game called tetris oh it was a whole thing i don't have time to get like deep into the details of it but basically the fight involved the handheld and arcade rights to tetris and russia was deeply involved as the game was created by two russian nationals if you're interested in more information on it i suggest the 2023 movie tetris not just because it gives you the details, but also because it stars Taron Egerton and Blanche is a fan. Uh, <laughs> there was a time during negotiations where Robert tried to use his close personal ties with Mikhail Gorbachev uh, to get negotiations to go his way. However, uh, since most of us grew up with Tetris, we know that Nintendo was the overall official winner of that bid. True crime within true crime side note. Woohoo! Like a Russian nesting doll made of true crime, I bring you a brief account of the murders <laughs> involved in the Tetris story. And wow. from what I remember, I don't believe these were mentioned in the movie. I could be wrong. I watched it months ago. My memory is terrible. But I just don't think it was mentioned. But Alexei Pajitnov created Tetris. And his friend Vladimir Pokilko is often credited as co-creating the game. In September 1998, police were called to Vladimir's home in Palo Alto, California, where they discovered the bodies of Vladimir, his wife Yelena Fedotova, and their son Peter. Yelena and Peter had both been bludgeoned to death with hammers and then stabbed, while Vladimir's throat had been cut. The hunting knife was still in his hand when police arrived. There was also a note in Vladimir's handwriting that read, quote, I've been eaten alive, Vladimir. Just remember that I am exist the devil. Wow. 
At the time of their deaths, Vladimir was 44, Yelena was 38, and Peter was just 12. While the scene initially looked like a murder-suicide, police stated the forensics and the physical evidence of the crime didn't line up with a murder-suicide scenario. Uh, two days after the murder, the FBI showed up with a warrant to take over the case. The FBI officially ruled the family's deaths a murder-suicide, suggesting that financial issues had led Vladimir to kill his family. There is a recent documentary called The Tetris Murders that talks about how some of the police believe the Russian mob was involved and that it was all some sort of cover-up. So I guess if you're interested, there's another true, not that the Tetris one was a true crime movie update, update. You knew what I meant. God, yep. I'm a mess. So back to Robert Maxwell. In 1987, Robert bought IPC Media and launched the London Daily News, which shut down five months later, reporting losses of approximately 25 million pounds, which is equivalent to about 31 million U.S. dollars. And remember, we're talking 31 million in 1987. So that's equivalent to about 83 million today. Wowzer. An $83 million loss in under six months is wild to me. And maybe a sign that Robert wasn't as good at business as he claimed. By 1988, Robert also owned Nimbus Records, the Berlitz Language School, uh, Mar Maxwell Cable TV, Maxwell Entertainment, and a half share of MTV in Europe. Hmm. That same year, he added Mac uh, Macmillan, Pu Macmillan Publishers for $2.6 billion and released a transnational newspaper called The European. Over the years, Robert's immense power and influence led him to being given an honorary life membership in the University of London's Institute of Philosophy, as well as an honorary law degree from Aberdeen University. In 1991, Robert was forced to sell off some of his companies, including Pergamon Press, as well as 49% of the stock of Mirror Group, to help cover his 440 million pound debt, which is about 546 million US dollars. Again, we're talking 1991 money, so today it would be closer to 1.2 billion. Wowzer. And yet, despite that massive debt, Robert then bought the New York Daily News, even though it was failing at the time. So maybe that purchase was less about future profits and more about stroking his savior complex. Or maybe he just liked the appearance of owning more. Appearances were definitely important for Robert Maxwell, and a great example um, of that would be the Maxwell family home. Since 1959, the family lived in a 53-room mansion known as Headington Hill Hall in Oxford, England. The home was originally built in 1824 by the Lion Brewery owner, James Morrell. It was expanded in 1856 by James Morrell Jr., who died in 1863. His wife, Alicia, died the following year, so the brewery, as well as Headington Hill Hall, were left to the couple's 10-year-old daughter, Emily. Trustees managed the inheritance until Emily was 20 when she married her third cousin and moved into the property. Who among us hasn't had a hot cousin? Hell, I do a podcast with mine. <laughs> Bless. I, I forget the jokes that I right into this uh jokes is a term i use loosely uh emily died in 1938 and the following year the property was used as a military hospital throughout world war ii after the war it was a rehabilitation center until 1958 during that time the actual owner of the house sold it to the oxford city council who in turn leased the property to robert maxwell so he never actually owned the house he was just leasing it, but he gave the impression that he owned that property. Mm. Whatever makes him look impressive. Right. Headington Hill Hall is currently home to the Oxford Brooks School of Law. Now, even though Robert didn't own the massive mansion, he still had private planes, helicopters, and a 180-foot yacht that was worth 15 million British pounds. The yacht was named Lady Jelaine after Robert and Betty's youngest child, 
who also happened to be Robert's favorite. But more on that later. But to give you an idea as to what Robert Maxwell was like, in June 1988, Robert wanted a lavish party to celebrate both his 65th birthday and the 40th anniversary of his company, Pergamon Press. And just knowing that information, a lavish party feels reasonable. The event, which was held at Headington Hill Hall, included fireworks and a performance from the cast of the musical Me and My Girl. And it wasn't so much a single party as it was technically three parties held over the course of an entire weekend. Friday night was the white tie event. Saturday was black tie. Sunday was informal. And there was also a fancy lunch held Saturday afternoon. And one might ask, why so many separate parties? Because it was the only way Robert could accommodate his 5,000 guests. Wow! Maybe I'm a celebration prude, but I think 5,000 is insane for people to have at a party. Maybe I'm wrong, but as an introvert, a party with five people is already too much for me. But maybe there were so many guests because Robert was just such a lovable guy. I mean, he was described as charismatic. He was also described as a bully with an incredible temper. Like the time he punched a journalist in the back of the head and then simply said, oh, it was just a case of mistaken identity. <laughs> oh. Or the time Robert fired a man for smoking in the elevator that they were riding in together. Robert handed the man 250 pounds and told him to leave immediately. The true joke is the man was not an employee there. He was just a courier delivering a package. So 250 tip. It's nice. Uh, and I know you're all thinking, Wow, I thought you said this guy had a temper. These examples are fairly tame. You're right. So how about the time he showed up at a dinner at a casino in London and he swept all the plates and cutlery off the table because he felt it was badly laid out? Robert was also said to be a bully towards anyone who worked for him, especially his own children. And one time he went on stage at a charity performance and lectured a prima ballerina on how to do a certain movement. No. As though he had any training whatsoever. And just because it's gross, uh, let's add to that the fact that Robert was known for leaving the door open when he used the toilet at his office. And sometimes he just liked to urinate off the top of the building. Yeah. Oh, full class act. Uh, also gross, but in another way, during his time with the Daily Mirror, the paper would often run contests. And one, like an example is it printed a photo and it's like, whoever can find the football in the photo will win a million pounds. Except there was no football because Robert outright told the promotions manager, make it so no one can win. Wow. Which justifies every one of those stupid contests that I ever entered as a kid. And I was like, nobody won. That's it. And I know that I'm also thinking about like all the coloring contests I did as a kid. And I was like, that's it. It's because no one won. It's because they were better, Christy. <laughs> Accept it. Accept it. It's fine. <laughs> it's it's very subjective, though. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, Robert also bugged the offices of the Daily Mirror so he could hear what the company's executives were saying about him. It was later discovered Robert also bugged his own home. So long story short, Robert was a controlling man who desperately wanted to seem far more impressive than he was. He was, however, a very rich man, but much of his wealth was tied in assets, so he didn't have a lot in the way of accessible cash. Although Robert claimed, quote, the banks owe, owe us money, so much money, uh, we have so much on deposit. In reality, it was Robert who owed the banks and just as Maxwell Communication Corporation executives began to realize just how much Robert owed, Robert suddenly decided to leave the country. On November 1st, 1991, Robert left London via his private helicopter and headed for his yacht, the Lady Jelaine. On November 3rd, the yacht was seen off the coast of Tenerife, which is the largest island of the Canary Islands. 
which is in Macronesia in the Atlantic Ocean. Despite a lot of things going on at work, Robert didn't respond to any calls or any messages from his executives. At 4.25 a.m. on November 5th, Robert called the crew complaining about the heat in his cabin. At 7.15 a.m., the staff went to wake Robert when they discovered his cabin was empty. They searched for hours, but Robert was nowhere to be found. At 1.19 p.m., helicopters and boats joined in the search, and Robert was presumed lost at sea. Then at 6.38 p.m., 14 hours after Robert was last heard from, his naked body was found by a fisherman 20 miles or 32 kilometers northwest of Grand Canary Island, which is about 15 miles or 24 kilometers southeast of the yacht. Robert Maxwell was 68 years old at the time of his death. He was described as a real character with a zest for life, but he was also said to be famously good at covering his tracks, a master manipulator, and that he, quote, attracted controversy, envy, and loyalty in great measure. The Daily Beast described Robert as, quote, one of the darkest and most mysterious men to appear in British public life. So what happened to Robert? An inquest into his death failed to come up with a definitive answer. Despite a tear in his left shoulder, there were no markings on Robert's body. It is believed the tear in the shoulder might have happened if Robert was hanging off the boat with his left arm. Three pathologists each performed a different autopsy. One concluded that Robert died of a heart attack. Another said it was a heart attack and then he drowned. And a third listed the cause of death as just drowning. The official ruling in December 1991 was that Robert died from a combination of heart attack and accidental drowning. The autopsies confirmed that Robert was alive when he entered the water. Mm. So was Robert's death an accident? Did he have a heart attack and fall over the edge of the yacht? He was known for urinating off the side of the boat. So did he wake up in the middle of the night to pee, got to the edge of the boat, lost his balance, and fall into the water? He was a very top-heavy man. The railings were just wires. So it's possible. Maybe he suffered a heart attack as he struggled in the water. It's likely he went into the water sometime between 4.45 and 7.15 a.m. And to me, if it was as simple as he lost his balance and fell in, you would think that Robert would be yelling for help. And yes, it would have been the middle of the night, but I just feel like at least one person on that boat would have been awake. So did Robert make noise and someone either didn't hear it or possibly purposely ignored it? Or did Robert make, not make any noise at all? If he suffered a heart attack, maybe he went into the water and then it's possible he didn't shout because he wasn't able to. But if his death wasn't an accident, is it possible that Robert took his own life? While Robert's family adamantly denies suicide as an option, we have to at least consider it. At the time of his death, Robert's entire empire was on the verge of collapse. As I mentioned earlier, Robert owed a lot of money to banks, or more specifically, he owed 4 billion British pounds to 43 different banks. One bank had given Robert 45 days to make a payment, but regardless as to the amount, Robert didn't have it. He defaulted on a £50 million loan from the Bank of England, who had scheduled a meeting with Robert for November 5th, the day he died. Ooh. So is it possible that Robert was trying to avoid the bank appointment because he knew he didn't have the money to cover for the payment? Was there more? Well, just hours after Robert's body was found, it was discovered that 460 million British pounds, or 570 million U.S. dollars, were missing from the Maxwell Communication Corporation pension fund. And a reminder that these are numbers from 1991. So if that had happened today, we're talking 1.3 billion U.S. dollars. Wow. Oh. Talking the pension of more than 30,000 current and former Maxwell employees. 
Also, six months before Robert's death, the Metropolitan Police Force started an investigation into allegations that Robert Maxwell was a war criminal. So now with all that in mind, is it possible Robert knew things were coming to a head and he couldn't handle the thought of prison? Or is it possible someone knew all this information and Robert Maxwell was murdered for it? There was a rumor that Robert had been a key informant for Israeli intelligence and that Israel had concerns that Robert would go public. I don't know how true those rumors are, but I know he was involved in various governments, including Israel, Russia, and Britain. Did he know something he shouldn't, or did he simply cross the wrong people? I'm sure that there is a way that you could inject something into someone to either induce a heart attack or just make it look like a heart attack. I'm sure I'm just paranoid. The captain and the crew of the yacht were all interviewed and the lead investigator concluded that no one could have gotten aboard without them knowing. So is it an inside job? I mean, I could also just be paranoid. To this day, Robert's family believes his death was an accident. And I think it's more than possible he had a heart attack, fell overboard, uh, but I think it's more than possible that Robert went overboard willingly, especially when he just happened to die on the very day he was supposed to meet with a bank about defaulting on a 50 million pound loan. The timing is too suspicious to be not connected in some way. And it's no surprise that Robert was considered a master manipulator. How else would he have been able to get billions of dollars in loans when he didn't have enough to repay it. And for those who may question Robert's business practices, I'd like to point out that in 1971, 20 years before the fraud was discovered, the Board of Trade in the UK declared Robert, and I quote, unfit to run a public company. I don't know why they determined it, but I'd say based on Robert's performance, the board was right. <laughs> but with Robert dead, what happens to his debts? What about the missing money from the company's pension fund? Well, we'll get into the Maxwell's financial problems and more, including a look into Robert's favorite child, Jelaine, after the break. Well, you heard the lady. It's that time. It's break one. Have some fun. Go get another drink. Hit the can. And we're going to be right back with more House of Maxwell on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Here we go on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing House of Maxwell. Before the break, I was riveted hearing about this. Uh, I had no idea that her father died in this mysterious circumstance. And I'm sure it's only going to become... More intriguing from here. Well, now that we've talked about Robert, it is time to focus on the rest of the Maxwell family. As you may recall, in 1945, Robert married Elizabeth Maynard, known as Betty. In the 70s and 80s, Betty devoted much of her time to Holocaust research she became a highly respected Holocaust historian, traveling and giving lectures, and even worked as an editor for the book Remembering for the Future, The Holocaust in an Age of Genocide. In the 80s, Betty earned a bachelor's degree in modern languages at St. Hugh's College, followed by a doctorate in French literature at Oxford, which she completed at the age of 60. Good for her. Impressive lady. Uh, she also received honorary fellowships from Tel Aviv University and the Wolf Institute of Cambridge, uh, as well as the Eternal Flame Award from the Anne Frank Institute. Beautiful. I also think it's incredibly lovely that after Robert lost his family to the Holocaust, that his wife became such a devoted person to uh, its history. And yes, and that I think that is beautiful. It. Yeah. Uh, after Robert's death, Betty was left without money or a home, and she was forced to leave Headington Hill Hall. Betty left the UK and spent some time in her native France before returning to Britain and living in a townhouse loaned to her by the Duke of Westminster, 
a.k.a. Major General Gerald Cavendish Grosvenor. <laughs> the current Duke is Gerald's son, Hugh. Fun fact, Gerald's sister, Edwina, is a goddaughter of Princess Diana. Huh. And his son, Hugh, is a godparent to Prince George of Wales, who apparently has seven godparents. It's too many. It's 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 a lot, but you know it is what it is. Uh, in 1994, Betty published her memoir, "A Mind of My Own: My Life with Robert Maxwell." She died in August 2013 at the age of 92. She was described as kind, wonderful, and supportive. Uh, as previously mentioned, Betty and Robert had nine children. Sadly, Corrine died in 1957, and Michael died a decade later in 1967. So what happened to the other seven? Well, Philip was the second oldest. He was born in 1948. He became a mathematician and scientist after winning a scholarship to Balliol College at Oxford at just 16 years old. Philip allegedly found Robert to be so demanding that Philip moved to Argentina in the late 1970s just to get away from him. Wow. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip married a woman named Nilda, and they had a daughter, Marcella. Robert was enraged about the marriage, and he and Philip had a falling out, which then led to Philip having a nervous breakdown. He eventually separated from his wife and returned to the UK, where he planned to become a writer. Anne, the third oldest, was born in 1949. She had dreams of becoming an actress, but it just never happened for her. But don't worry, Robert handled the situation like a loving, supportive parent and said to Anne, and I quote, What have you and Pope John Paul II got in common? You're both ugly and you're both failed actors. Oh, wow. What a guy. Anne <laughs> went to Oxford, where she studied French and Italian before training as a Montessori teacher. It is believed that Anne is now working as a hypnotherapist under an alias to try and distance herself from the scandals attached to the Maxwell name. Twins Christine and Isabel, the fourth and fifth Maxwell children, were born in 1950. Isabel earned a master's degree in law and history from St. Hilda's College in 1972, followed by a master's degree in education from the University of Edinburgh. She then turned her sights to the movie industry, making her first film in 1973. In 1981, Isabel moved to California, where she continued to produce and direct documentaries. In 1990, Isabel gave up film and started working with her sister, Christine, at an internet data company. In 1995, they launched Magellan, one of the earliest internet search engines. A year later, they sold their shares to a rival company, Excite, for 100 million pounds. Isabel then became president of ComTouch, an Israeli internet company from 1997 to 2001, before becoming the director of the Israel Venture Network from 2004 to 2010. So far in her life, Isabel had been married three times, uh, first to American filmmaker Dale Durassi, during which uh, they had a son. Then she married the Magellan co-founder, David Hayden. And thirdly, she married illusionist Al Seckel in 2007. Illusions, Michael. However, Al forgot to file the papers to get his previous marriage annulled, so his marriage to Isabel was not actually legal. Mm. The couple moved to France to care for Isabel's mother, Betty, and they chose to stay after Betty's death. In July 2015, Al's rental car was discovered in a parking lot on the edge of a small village. The doors were unlocked and the keys were in the ignition. His body was found two miles away at the body of a 100-foot cliff, about 80 miles or 128 kilometers north of Toulouse. He was 56 years old. Wow. Al's death occurred just days after an article was published about the various frauds that Al had committed, starting with the fact that he told people he graduated from Cornell 
and that he was a doctoral candidate at Caltech. Neither were true. He did go to Cornell briefly, but he never graduated. Mm. But somehow he managed to bullshit his way into giving a TED Talk in 2007. He also ripped off a lot of rich people by selling them rare old books, which turned out to be fake. Al's death was officially ruled a suicide, although that knowledge wasn't made public until 2022, which made a lot of people believe that Al maybe faked his own death. Interpol allegedly contacted the French police three separate times just to confirm that Al was really dead. Wow. Less than six months after Al's death, Isabel was declared bankrupt and no shade to her. But how on earth do you spend 50 million pounds in 20 years? I'm sure it's easier than I think, but it's shocking to me, especially when she worked in executive level positions for over a decade after she made her fortune. Yeah. Isabel was last known to be living in France. Christine, on the other hand, graduated from Pitzer College in May 1972 with a Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in sociology and Latin American studies. Two years later, she earned a postgraduate teaching certificate from the Lady Spencer Churchill College of Education, followed by a master's degree in interdis interdisciplinary studies from the University of Texas at Dallas. Christine spent two years teaching middle school in Oxford before returning to America, where she worked for Robert at Pergamon Press West Coast office. In the 90s, Christine and her sister created Magellan before selling their shares in 96, which netted each sister 50 million pounds. Christine stayed in the software field, co-founding another company before becoming the program manager of learning technologies at the University of Texas at Dallas. Christine married an astrophysicist in 1986, and the couple have three children. Apparently, this was Christine's second wedding, and Robert didn't even bother to attend. Betty asked why he didn't go, and Robert said, quote, I meant to, but after all, it was her second. Wow. Just glowing reviews for this man as a father. Mm. Now, I spent time before the break talking about the financial troubles that Robert caused. And so far in this portion, the only person that seems to have been affected by those crimes was Robert's wife, Betty, who was forced out of their house and left to rely on her children for money. But now we've gotten to the two children who were easily the most affected by Robert's fraud, and that's his youngest two sons, Ian and Kevin. Ian was born in 1956 and allegedly ridiculed by his father whenever the family had guests over. Robert also often compared Ian to Kevin, which is incredibly unfair and a gross thing to do to your child in general. In 1991, Ian married American model Laura Plume. The couple divorced five years later. Ian has since married two more times. The youngest son, Kevin, born in 1959, seemed to idolize his father. After Robert's death, Kevin said that he, quote, missed his presence and ability to dominate, which feels like a lot to unpack there, especially when it was said that Robert often humiliated Kevin publicly. A woman who briefly worked as vice president for the Maxwell McMillan Group said Robert would get Kevin on speakerphone and then just scream and berate him in front of everyone. Wow. Again, super nice guy. In 1984, Kevin married fellow Oxford alum Pandora Warnford Davis. The couple had seven children, including Tilly in 1985, Ted in 86, Eloise in 88, Chloe in 89, Madeline in 93, Tom in 96, and Maya in 2002. Seven kids immediately made me think of Robert. And hey, I did say that Kevin idolized his father. Yeah. According to Pandora, the couple seemed to have a child every time their marriage got difficult. She said, quote, I didn't plan it, but with hindsight, when all the terrible things happened, my reaction was to get pregnant. I wonder if subconsciously I was thinking having a baby would fix everything. After 23 years of marriage, Kevin and Pandora separated in 2007 and later divorced. 
After Robert's death, Ian and Kevin assumed control of Maxwell Co Communication Corporation, and they tried to keep the business afloat. But it proved to be an impossible task, especially when you combine the fact of the country going through a recession at the time with the fact that Robert owed an incredible amount of money. I remind you that uh, it was discovered Robert owed four billion British pounds to 43 different banks. So Robert's death made those banks very worried and they all came to collect. However, the funds they were looking for did not exist. Mm -hmm. And then there was the pesky business of 460 million British pounds missing from the Maxwell Corporation pension fund. Since they are now in charge, they were left to deal with the fallout. And Robert, and since Robert was known for making every single company decision on his own, since he didn't trust anyone, and because his sons were high-level positions, it made people question how much Ian and Kevin really knew about that missing money. On June 19, 1992, Kevin and Ian and their financial advisor, Larry Trachtenberg, were all arrested and charged with conspiracy to defraud others of millions of dollars. Oh. There was an amazing moment caught on camera where the police arrive at Kevin's house to arrest him. They bang on his door and his wife, Pandora, opens the window and yells, piss off or I'll call the police. They respond very calmly, madam, we are the police. And no shade to Pandora. She was just trying to protect her family from what she thought was paparazzi. Of course. Shortly after his arrest, Kevin filed what would become Britain's largest bankruptcy order for 407 million pounds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. A bankruptcy order is essentially when you can't afford to pay the money you owe, usually after a year, you are discharged from bankruptcy. Kevin's bankruptcy was dis discharged three years later in 1995. It was described as Britain's trial of the century, which is not lost on me that it's the same way the Alex Murdoch trial was described in America. The trial started in mid-1995 and continued for eight months. I'm going to do my best here to break down the fraud, but I am terrible at maths and find most corporate banking to be confusing as hell. And yes, even as a non-Brit, I did purposely say maths there because I find it charming that they call it maths. I've also been watching a lot of British TV. It's not the of point. Course. So during the trial, it was shown that in 1989, Robert had created a way to give himself access to the pension funds. First, he combined the 700 million pounds that had been invested to the pensions of his companies, including Mirror Group newspapers and the Maxwell Communication Corporation. Once the money was siphoned, Robert then created a new company, Bishop's Gate Investment Management, so he had a place to put the siphoned money. Robert also made himself chairman of Bishop's Gate because you can't steal if you aren't in charge. On July 4th, 1991, Robert signed over 75 million pounds of that siphoned pension money to himself. He then instructed his company to use the remaining pension money to buy shares of an Israeli printing company. He claimed he would sell the shares on behalf of the pension fund. He believed he would make a huge profit. And on October 9th, he sold the shares and he made a huge profit which he used to pay off his own bank debts instead of putting that money back into the pension fund. Mm. Overall, in a span of just nine months, Robert stole roughly 933 million pounds from oh. three different sections of his empire, including two public companies and the pension funds. He tried to hide his schemes by having the April 1991 audit pushed to December. How much did the executives of this company know? How involved were Ian, Kevin, and this Larry guy? After 11 days of jury deliberation, Ian, Kevin, and Larry were all acquitted in January 1996. 
However, a report concluded that Kevin, quote, bore a heavy responsibility for what happened. Mm. But Pandora said that Kevin was, quote, the most charismatic, brilliant man. He is nothing like his father. He is intelligent and quick-witted and decent and honorable, whatever people say. In the end, the trial cost taxpayers 12 million pounds in Oof. legal aid. And while money and assets were taken from other parts of the Maxwell Empire to try and repay the pension fund, the pensioners only received about half of their entitled amount. On September 22nd, 1991, just 44 days before his pension fraud scheme would come to light, Robert published an article in the Sunday Mirror that said he treated pensioners from Mirror Group newspapers better than any other employee would have or employer oh, would have. Boy. Also, according to Robert's widow, Betty, she claims the pension money was all returned. It was not. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Betty said, quote, they stopped my pension from the Mirror Group newspapers. The only person who actually lost her pension is me. All the others have continued to be paid. Again, the people who paid into their pensions only got half what they put in. And stand down, Betty, because I was on your side. Yeah, exactly. Stand down. Uh, and while I am sympathetic to someone whose husband has died, to imply publicly that you are the only real victim of your husband's pension scheme is a bold move. Mm -hmm. Due to conditions involved in his bankruptcy filing, Kevin was only able to do business overseas. So in 1998, he co-founded Telemond, Tele, yeah, Telemond, a U.S.-based media company, which he hoped would become the Maxwell comeback story. At first, Kevin owed, owned 7% stake in the company, which was worth about £16 million in 1999. By 2001, the company had debts of over $100 million. Kevin then moved on to high-end commercial property. Unfortunately, that resulted in the 2011 investigation by the Insolvency Service, which discovered that Kevin and two other directors had diverted more than £2 million from their construction company, Synchro, before it went into administration, meaning the company was insolvent, or rather, they had debts they couldn't pay. It's a big no-no to take money out of your company to try and hide it from creditors following the investigation investigation kevin was banned from running a company for eight years which i didn't even realize was a thing but yeah in 2017 kevin filed for bankruptcy a second time since then kevin and ian have launched an organization in greece to help during the greek financial crisis it raised millions of euros which made it possible to create several hundred businesses which is positive and probably one of the nicest things I will say about the Maxwells. Although <laughs> I will say Kevin is the only Maxwell sibling to ever publicly express remorse for the crimes that Robert committed. We still don't know fully exactly how involved Kevin was, but the apology was nice. Doesn't make up for it. It was, it was a nice touch. Mm -hmm. Especially when Robert's daughter, Jelaine, seemed to deny that her father did anything wrong. She said, quote, A thief to me is somebody who steals money. Do I think my father did that? No. I don't know what he did. Obviously something happened. Did he put it in his own pocket? Did he run off with the money? No. And that's my definition of a crook. He's not a thief because he didn't run off with the money. ran off to a yacht and sailed to another country how far did he have to go to fit into this definition of a thief <laughs> chalet for the love of god for real oh my god oh god but i know that jelaine will defend her father until the end of time because she was the favorite mm. and speaking of jelaine it's time to talk about the youngest Maxwell sibling and the one I'm sure you've all been the most anxious to hear about. 
The ninth and final child born to Robert and Betty was, of course, Jelaine Noel Marion Maxwell, who was born in France on December 25th, 1961. Just days after her birth, her oldest brother, Michael, was in a car accident. Oh. He died from his injuries six years later. Jelaine went to Oxford High School for Girls before attending Edgar Lee Hall Prep School. In 1985, she earned a degree in modern history with languages from Balliol College at Oxford. Also, can you imagine just days after having your last baby, your oldest kid is in a car accident? It's wild yeah. to me. And also the fact that the oldest one died exactly 10 years after the first child died. Yeah. It's wild. It's Creepy. Wild. But Robert and Jelaine had a very close relationship. It was openly stated that Jelaine was Robert's favorite, which I'm sure wasn't hurtful at all to the other six siblings. I mean, he named his yacht the Lady Jelaine. An easier solution would have been, name it after your wife. But I'm not a bone owner, so I'll let it go. A bone owner? I meant boat. I was trying to let it go. This is all back to gear again. <laughs> I'm so yeah. sorry. I, I, I had to. I couldn't let that one go. I was like, you I don't think she me meant honest. bone owner. Oh, God. I can't. No, I was going to try and make a joke about bone owner, but I'm not a boat owner. There we go. Thank you. That was better. Keeping me honest. Doing great. Uh, well, something I refuse to let go is how weird Robert and Jelaine were towards each other. I don't know the details. And honestly, I don't want to know. But according to Robert's secretary, Jelaine and Robert would often meow at each other. When Jelaine called the office. And no, you did not mishear me. I said meow. As in, Robert would answer the phone and Jelaine would respond, meow. And I, Robert would then meow back at her and they would just meow back and forth at each other for a while without using actual words. I don't get it. Um, I Again, I don't think I want to. But mm -mm. the only time I ever meow at anyone in conversation is when I'm talking to my cats. Shout out to Evie and Cheddar. One wants love all the time and acts like a hyper toddler, while the other wants no love ever and acts like an angry senior. I love her, but she's toxic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to put it away that very few, probably no one listening to this will ever understand. If you've ever seen the delightful British show Taskmaster, Evie is the Greg to my Alex. Uh, if you needed a sign to start watching Taskmaster, this is it. <laughs> but if you needed a sign to know that meowing at your adult daughter is fucking weird, please take this as that sign as well. Robert also didn't allow Jelaine to bring any boyfriends home and told her she wasn't allowed to be seen with them in public. Which sounds like a man who didn't want to ever see his daughter with another man, which adds a level of creep to their yeah. relationship. And you can say he was just super protective, but he didn't say she couldn't have boyfriends, just he was never allowed to see them. Which again adds to the ick factor. Maybe it's just me and my mind has been broken from researching entitled gross white men for the past five weeks of my life, i.e. Nicholas Alaverdian and Alex Murdoch. But from the early 80s until Robert's death in 1991, every job that Jelaine had was in some way linked to her father. It started when Robert had computers installed at Hennington Hill Hall, where Jelaine had her first job training to use a computer and eventually learn coding. After Robert purchased the Oxford United Football Club, Jelaine was taken on as director. 
Then after Robert acquired the New York Daily News in January 1991, he sent Ghislaine to New York to act as his representative. But when he died, Ghislaine was left in an unfortunate situation. To quote the New York Post, she had put more effort into socializing than developing a career. And while her father left her a trust fund of 80,000 pounds a year, which is about 100,000 US dollars, uh, for someone who is used to a life of excess, that trust fund wasn't going to be enough. I also find it interesting that Robert was able to leave her money at all when he was billions in debt. Yeah. And I didn't see any note of any other trust funds Robert left, just that he left Jelaine a trust fund through a bank in Liechtenstein. Wow. Which I could be wrong, but suspicious. As yeah. though he left her money through a bank in a very small country to hide it from creditors and anyone who might look into Robert's finances. I'm speculating. But why else would he set up a trust fund in the sixth smallest nation in the world. If it had been in the UK, that might have felt legit to me. Or France or Israel, since Robert frequently visited both. But Liechtenstein feels like Robert was purposely hiding money. And you know, I couldn't let it go, so I tried to look a little further, and it turns out Robert had at least two entities that were based in Liechtenstein, or at least they were on paper. One of those entities was the Maxwell Foundation, which acted as a holding company for more than 400 worldwide businesses. Again, I think it was all just a bunch of paperwork used to hide money. Before his death, Robert told the banks he had billions stashed in a trust in Liechtenstein, but nothing was ever found. Mm -hmm. In a March 1992 interview with Vanity Fair, Robert's widow Betty said, quote, I know absolutely nothing about Liechtenstein. I've never been in Liechtenstein. And I know all I know is the greatest disappointment for the press is there's never going to be money anywhere. She also wasn't asked about Liechtenstein. She just brought that up on her own uh, before. Oh, no. Uh, Betty even claims no money was left for Jelaine, but multiple sources, including the New York Times, claim that trust fund of 100,000 US dollars was absolutely left for Jelaine. After Robert's funeral, Jelaine went to New York, where she lived in Manhattan and worked at a real estate office. And by worked, I mean more like socialized with rich people, because that's what she was good at. Now, at some point after Jelaine moved to New York, she had a brief relationship with creep Jeffrey Epstein, who I am only going to refer to as Epstein, because I don't want to seem too familiar and use the pile of garbage's first name. Respect. Also, I know the entire Jelaine and Epstein chapter of this story is big enough that it could have been its own episode. But honestly, I don't like talking about him. So let's consider the fact that I'm bringing him, bringing him up now a win for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Epstein was born January 20th, 1953 in Brooklyn. He skipped two grades in school and graduated high school in 1969. He then attended Cooper Union for two years before transferring to current, current Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University in 1971. He left three years later in 1974, and despite not earning a degree, he somehow managed to get a job teaching math at the Dalton School in Manhattan. He was wow. fired in 1976 due to poor performance, which isn't exactly a surprise when you hire a man with zero training to be a teacher when he turns out to be a shit teacher. Just a thought. Yeah. Epstein then set his sights on the financial circuit in 1976, working his way from junior assistant up to floor trader at Bear Stearns. He became an options trader, and eventually started his own company, Intercontinental Assets Group, in August 1981. As a consultant and hedge fund manager, Epstein made a fortune in the 80s, and in the 90s, he became well known for his incredible wealth and philanthropy. Over the course of nine years, Epstein made more than 20 donations to Harvard, 
totaling $9.2 million. In response, in 2005, Harvard made Epstein a visiting fellow in their psychology department, even though they admitted that he, quote, lacked the academic qualifications visiting fellows typically possess. Jeez. He was readmitted as a fellow in 2006, but was asked to withdraw his application following his arrest. What arrest am I talking about and what led to it? It's time to bring back Jelaine. So there is a debate as to when Jelaine and Epstein actually met. According to Epstein's former business partner, Robert introduced Jelaine to Epstein in the late 80s. The Times reported that Jelaine and Epstein met at a party in New York in the early 90s, and Jelaine herself claims they met in 1991 through a mutual friend. I find it interesting they've spent so long trying to hide when they met, as though that matters at all. Yeah. I think Jelaine was trying to avoid people making any poten potential potential pon potential connection between Epstein and her father. After Robert's death, Jelaine allegedly found papers with Epstein's name on them in Robert's cabin on the yacht, and she gave strict instructions to the crew to shred them all. Oh. There is a photo of the two of them, which was taken less than three weeks after Robert's death, so it's more than possible that they knew each other when Robert was still alive. But regardless as to when they met, Jelaine and Epstein dated for a while, and despite a breakup, remained very close for the rest of Epstein's life. They weren't officially linked until a Daily Mail article about Jelaine in April 1993, which claimed Epstein was her boyfriend. Members of Epstein's household staff say that Epstein referred to Jelaine as his girlfriend and as the lady of the house. In a 2003 interview with Vanity Fair, Epstein referred to Jelaine as his best friend. Okay. She also worked for Epstein, running his properties, traveling with him, and organizing dinners at his home for influential people. She had her father's charisma and acted as Epstein's social director. Epstein gave Jelaine the money, influence, and lavish lifestyle that she had before her father died. In a way, Epstein became her replacement father. They shared a similar dynamic. Jelaine was willing to schmooze and socialize in a way that Epstein didn't know how to do. And in return, she got to go to fancy parties and fly on private jets and live the life she had grown accustomed to before Robert's death. Epstein and Jelaine ran in elite circles, becoming friends with many high-level lawyers, politicians, business moguls, and celebrities, including Bill Clinton, Alan Dershowitz, Donald Trump, and Prince Andrew, who has known Jelaine since she was an undergrad at Oxford. They have even vacationed together at least eight times. Jelaine also attended three writing retreats, one of which was hosted by Jeff Bezos. Mm. And Jelaine was photographed at an Oscars after party with Elon Musk, and the internet won't let him forget it. And that thrills me. <laughs> Musk also attended some fancy dinner that was also attended by Epstein and Mark Zuckerberg at some point after 2009. I don't know how close Musk or Bezos were with Jelaine or Epstein, but you have to admit that they are each other's kind of people. In 1990, Epstein bought an $18 million mansion in Palm Beach, Florida. Six years later, he changed his company name to the Financial Trust Company and based it in the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, which we all know is a thing that super rich people do to avoid taxes. Not that the rich pay taxes anyway, but I don't have time to get snarky about that today. But basically, by moving the company to the islands, he was able to reduce his federal income taxes by 90%. It makes me sick. I can't think about it. Speak of, speaking of sickening, in 1998, Epstein purchased Little St. James, a private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He paid $7.95 million through a limited liability company, or LLC, which protects the owners from personal responsibility for the debts and liabilities of the company. Fun fact, 
Little St. James is the same island where magician David Copperfield proposed to model Claudia Schiffer in January 1994. The couple met three months earlier when Copperfield brought Claudia up on stage for some illusion during a celebrity gala. The couple separated in September 1999. True crime and cocktails come for the true crime. Stay for the 90s pop culture references. Hell yeah. Epstein's Island came to be known by locals as the Island of Sin and Pedophile Island. Why? Because Epstein was a fucking creep. <laughs> <laughs> in 2005, a parent reported to police that her 14-year-old daughter had been molested by Epstein at his mansion in Palm Beach, Florida. Epstein, of course, denied it. And when police raided Epstein's mansion, all the hard drives and security cameras were missing, as though maybe he was tipped off. However, police confiscated all phone books and message pads, one of which had the alleged victim's name on it. And to be clear, I say alleged, because I'm trying to protect us legally from the filthy swine, but let it be known, we believe victims on our show. Yep. Police identified at least 36 victims, some as young as 14. One of the victims claimed that Epstein found her working at Mar-a-Lago in 1999 when she was 15. That same year, Epstein allegedly forced the girl to have sex with Prince Andrew, the girl that Jelaine, the girl told, the girl said Jelaine told her she had to do for Andrew what she does for Epstein, which is vile. Prince Andrew, of course, denies ever meeting the girl, despite the fact that there is a photo of them together. The girl eventually sued Andrew, and they settled out of court. Andrew has stepped back from his royal duties for the foreseeable future due to his ties with Epstein. Mm -hmm. Another victim was allegedly approached by Jelaine in 2001, who convinced the girl to go to Epstein's gross island to give him sexual massages. The girl was just 14 at the time. She also alleges that Epstein sexually assaulted her in 2002. And I want it made clear, I absolutely do not blame these girls for getting roped into these schemes. Jelaine would often approach girls from disadvantaged backgrounds and offer the money that they desperately needed to survive or she would tell the girls oh my god you're so pretty you should be a model and then tell them if she if the girls came with her she'd introduce them to the head of victoria's secret jelaine allegedly groomed so many girls and young women and tricked them into being part of epstein's dirty secret it is a horror show overall yeah in may Absolutely 2006 is. Epstein and two of his assistants were charged with multiple counts of unlawful sex with a minor. The state attorney decided to send the case to a grand jury who, after hearing from a single victim, indicted Epstein on one count of solicitation of prostitution. The verdict did not include the fact that the victim was a minor. After the grand jury indictment, Epstein was arrested in July 2006 with for solicitation of prostitution. At the same time, the FBI opened a federal investigation into Epstein's various criminal activities. In 2008, Epstein took a plea deal, which stated that Epstein would agree to 13 months at a low security prison in exchange for the federal investigation against him to stop. At the time of his deal, the FBI had identified 36 underage victims, and yet the asshole got the deal anyway, which also gave him immunity from being prosecuted on any future related charges brought against him. He officially pleaded guilty to one count of solicitation of prostitution and one count of solicitation of prostitution with a minor. Epstein was sentenced to 18 months and forced to register as a sex offender in Florida. But of course, thanks to his deal, Epstein was released in July 2009 after serving just 13 months. But the thing about that 13 months that they didn't mention publicly until years later is that during the day, every single day, Epstein was free to go wherever the fuck he wanted. Not in the prison. I'm talking the outside world. But at night, he had to return to the prison and sleep there before being freed again the following morning. 
And to that, I say, that is not prison time. That is sleepovers with your prison besties. I am going to use a word that I don't believe I've ever used on this show to describe my own feelings. I am appalled that this was ever allowed. They called it a work release program. What a fucking joke. The system is broken. I can't get fully into it in this moment. But thankfully, Epstein had to register as a sex offender as of 2008. But that didn't seem to put a damper on his life in any way. Earlier, I mentioned in 2005, Epstein was made a visiting fellow in the psychology department at Harvard, despite lacking any academic qualifications. I guess they don't care what your academic background is as long as you donate millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But they aren't the only ones. After Epstein's conviction, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology accepted a $750,000 donation from Epstein and allowed him to visit their campus at least nine separate times. A registered, convicted sex offender was invited to spend time on a college campus. I can't. After his arrest for soliciting minors, Harvard asked Epstein to withdraw his application for visiting fellow, and you'd think that meant Harvard was smart enough to distance themselves from a convicted sex offender. But after his conviction and his addition to the sex offender registry, Harvard outright gave Epstein his own office in 2008, as well as a key card and a passcode to access the Program for Evolutionary Dynamics building. He visited the building more than 40 times between 2008 and 2018, usually accompanied by his assistants, who, would you believe, were a series of young women. Mm. And while the Harvard president made it so that Epstein couldn't donate money to the school, there was a loophole that Epstein could donate to individual programs at the school so even after his conviction, Epstein continued to give money to the Program for Evolutionary Dynamics at Harvard. After being released from jail, Epstein was hit with dozens of lawsuits filed by women who all claimed Epstein had molested them while they were underage. In 2011, Epstein was ordered to register as a sex offender in New York, but he never checked in with the NYPD and no one ever looked into it and they all just kind of let that go. Between 2015 and 2017, more lawsuits were filed against Epstein, and some were even filed against Jelaine, claiming Jelaine allegedly recruited the girls that Epstein and his famous friends allegedly abused. This includes a 2016 lawsuit from a woman who claimed that Donald Trump sexually assaulted her at Epstein's mansion in 1994 when the girl was 13. Ooh, ooh. Epstein and Trump both deny the allegations. Many of the lawsuits came from incidents that allegedly occurred at Epstein's private island. By 2008, Epstein had 70 staff members on that private island. And I'm sure that some of you are thinking, it's an island. So how did Epstein get back and forth to the U.S.? Great question, and thank you for engaging. In 2007, Epstein paid for Jelaine to get her helicopter pilot's license, so she could fly him back and forth whenever needed, no. especially since she was with him most of the time anyway. Epstein also purchased a $4 million helicopter for Jelaine to pilot. That's insane. A hundred percent. Absolutely insane. It's the most rich person thing I think I've ever heard. But also that it's like, it's, I, I'll save it till the end, but I'm just, it's, it's bizarre at this point. Like, hey, you know what? We need you to pilot this helicopter. What was she doing? Anyway. She was trying to please dad. Yeah. Great point. Say it for what it is. Uh, is it surprising she went along with it all? Nope. Not when she was using Epstein as her replacement father figure and willing to do anything to please him. Allegedly. Of course. According to some of the victims, Jelaine would also use the helicopter to bring girls to and from the island. It mm. was said that three different girls would arrive at the island every day. It is estimated that with Jelaine's help, Epstein may have sexually exploited and abused upwards of 100 young women and girls. They allegedly threatened the girls and their families, so they were too terrified to run or go to the police. Epstein allegedly told the girls that 
someone once accused him of rape. So he planted drugs in her apartment and that girl got arrested and went to jail. Whether it's true or not, it's a hell of a threat to like a 15 year old girl. Oh my God. On July 6, 2019, Epstein was arrested again, this time with one count of sex trafficking of a minor and one count of conspiracy to engage in sex trafficking. He was denied bail, which is delicious. And yes, I'm allowed to take joy in an entitled rich white man finally seeing actual consequences to his own actions. In the documentary, someone said something about Epstein that will haunt me until the day I die. They said Epstein liked when the girls were scared. Oh, God. He was a vile man, and I was happy to see him put behind bars. Yep. But why would they deny him bail? Maybe because when police searched Epstein's house in Manhattan, they allegedly found a locked safe which contained diamonds, cash, and a passport, which had Epstein's picture, but a completely different name. Mm. The passport, which was from the early 80s, and had expired by that point, listed Epstein's country of residence as Saudi Arabia. Come so on. if the weird passport is expired, why deny him bail? Because the bitch ain't trustworthy. God. If he had that expired one, he could also have a current one somewhere. A hundred percent. In his financial information disclosure, which is necessary in a bail request, Epstein neglected to mention certain assets, such as the art and diamonds that were found at his home. The document also claimed his New York mansion was worth $56 million, not the $77 million that it was appraised at. Woof. After a month in jail, Epstein signed a new will, which put more than $577 million worth of assets into a trust he called the 1953 Trust. Why? Probably because if found guilty, moving assets around would make it a lot harder for his accusers to get paid any damages. Oof. But just two days after signing the new will, Epstein was found dead in his jail cell around 6.30 a.m. on August 10th, 2019. Prison staff immediately initiated life-saving measures before Epstein was transported to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. He was 66 years old. Speaking of jailhouse deaths, side note, Jean-Luc Brunel was a French model scout who ran international modeling agency Karen Models. He also founded MC2 Model Management, which he did thanks to financing from his BFF Epstein. Brunel was accused of grooming young women and helping in Epstein's sex trafficking ring. After Epstein's death, Brunel went into hiding which caused the French National Police to launch an investigation into him. On December 16th, 2020, Brunel was intercepted by police at the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris as he was attempting to board a flight to Senegal. Brunel was arrested and charged with sexual assault, human trafficking, and criminal conspiracy, all involving minors. In June 2021, Brunel was also charged with drugging and raping a 17-year-old girl Ugh. back in the 90s. He denied the allegations. In February 2022, Brunel was found hanging in his jail cell. He was 75 years old. Epstein's death caused a huge controversy as the medical examiner determined that his cause of death was suicide by hanging. And Epstein was on suicide watch at the time. Prison guards Michael Thomas and Tova Noel were on shift that night, sitting just five yards or 15 feet from Epstein's cell. They were supposed to check on Epstein every half hour. However, at the time of Epstein's death, no correctional officer conducted any count or search of the area between 10.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. One guard was looking at furniture websites. The other was checking sports news and pricing out motorcycles. They also both slept for two hours during that time frame. To cover their own asses, they repeatedly signed false certifications, attesting that they had conducted multiple counts of the inmates that they absolutely did not do. 
In November 2019, both guards pleaded guilty to charges of falsifying records on the night of Epstein's death, as well as to a conspiracy charge. They each took a plea deal that included 100 hours of community service in exchange for their charges being dismissed six months later. And does this all feel like a conspiracy? Of course. Is it possible Epstein took his own life because he felt that it was a better option than years in prison? Yes. Although last time he worked out a pretty sweet deal, so I'm less likely to believe he really thought he was going down this time. But if he didn't take his life, how did he end up hanging in his prison cell? Is it possible it was staged to look like a suicide? According to the autopsy report, Epstein's hyoid bone was broken, which can happen in a suicide, but it can also happen when someone is strangled. Dr. Michael Baden, a forensic pathologist who was hired by Epstein's brother and present at the time of the autopsy, said that there were markings on Epstein's face that are usually an indication of strangulation. Regarding the broken bones in Epstein's neck, Dr. Baden said, quote, I have never seen three fractures like this in a suicidal hanging. He told 60 Minutes, quote, going over a thousand jail hangings, suicides in the New York state prisons over the past 40 to 50 years, no one had three fractures. Also, no photos exist of Epstein's body hanging in the cell, which would have helped to clarify certain aspects of the autopsy, including the location of the ligature around Epstein's neck and injuries found on the body post-mortem. Those injuries include an abrasion on his left forearm, deep muscle hemorrhaging in his left shoulder, and contusions on both wrists. There was also a cut on his lip, an injury to the back of his neck, and an injection mark in his arm, which apparently could have come from the doctor's attempt to resuscitate him when he was first taken to the hospital. But it seemed he was pronounced dead pretty much when he got there. So I don't know if they would have had to inject him with anything, but uh, mm. okay. Also strange is that based on the photos from Epstein's cell, there were two nooses made of orange bed sheets found on the floor. Only one, the noose that they believed was the one around his neck, was collected and tested. However, according to the photos, the noose in evidence has a folded hem on both ends. However, the first guard who found Epstein claimed he cut the noose before trying to revive Epstein. So if the noose was cut, then it goes without saying that one of the ends would be cut and they wouldn't both still be perfectly hemmed and folded over. Yep. Did one or more super rich, disgusting men realize that Epstein going on trial would potentially bring their own crimes to light? I don't have proof, but I'd put money on it. Speaking of money, Epstein's horror show Island was listed for sale along with a neighboring island in March 2022 for $125 million. It sold in May 2023 for $60 million. So Epstein was convicted once and arrested twice for these crimes. What about Jelaine? Well, with Epstein's first arrest, Jelaine was not charged. But during the second investigation, many of the lawsuits brought against Epstein claimed that Jelaine was involved. Or more specifically, that she was the one that found the girls and brought them to Epstein. After Epstein's death, Jelaine tried to lay low in her home in New Hampshire. And then on July 2nd, 2020, Jelaine was officially charged with six counts involving the trafficking of minors, including conspiracy and transportation of a minor for illegal sexual activity. It allegedly took 20 armed FBI agents to secure her arrest. When the FBI arrived at Jelaine's home, they saw her through a window trying to lock herself in another room. They breached the front door and discovered Jelaine's cell phone, which was covered in tinfoil. Because some people truly believe that makes a cell phone untraceable. Oh my Spoiler, God. Spoiler, it does <laughs> it not. It does not, no. 
Uh, although apparently, according to the internet, putting tinfoil around your phone uh, can cause your battery to drop faster. Uh, mainly because okay. it's going back and forth trying to connect. Oh, losing internet yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, and so if, that would wear down your battery more, but not. But can't you it. also just turn off the phone? Yep. <laughs> turn the phone off. Take out the SIM card. Because I'm trash the phone. Trash yeah. the SIM card. Separate places. Good job. Of a, of a, yeah, I think if you turn it off, I don't think that they can continue. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I was under the impression you, they can't continue to track you if the phone is off. Well, because how many times have we done this where we're like, they they found the phone, but then it either died or was turned off. Exactly. When you're trying to find, yeah. on the other side, when you're trying to find a victim and they're looking for the phone yeah. and it's like, then the phone died and they couldn't continue. Yeah. yeah. Look, oh, I, I, I take absolute pleasure in laughing at a terrible, terrible person when they do something stupid. But can 100%. you imagine, did she have to go to a store and get some tinfoil and was like, ha this'll do it. It's like, oh my God, stop it. Anyhow, Jelaine pleaded not guilty and her lawyers proposed a $5 million bond saying that Jelaine would stay in a luxury hotel. The beautiful thing is her bail was denied. Luxury hotel, my ass. Now, something that I was surprised to learn about Jelaine in all of this is that at the time of her arrest, Jelaine was married. I didn't know that. Apparently, in 2013, Jelaine was speaking at the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik, where she met tech CEO Scott Borgerson. He was married at the time with two children, but that didn't stop him and Jelaine from starting an affair. Allegedly, Scott's wife found out about the affair when Scott was supposedly on a business trip in London. When he left, he told his wife he was going to send her videos. And allegedly... The videos he sent her were of Scott and Jelaine making out in Miami. Jesus. I honestly hope this isn't true because this is unbelievably callous and a shitty thing to do to anybody, but especially the mother of your children who you've been married to for 14 years. They officially divorced in 2015 and a year later, Jelaine and Scott were married. At the time, Jelaine was 55 and Scott was 41. Wowzer. When Jelaine was first arrested, Scott seemed very supportive. But after Jelaine was in prison for more than a year, Scott filed for divorce. I saw something that was like, oh, 500 and some days in prison puts a real damper on a marriage. And I was like, good. I can't. Yeah. That wasn't a real marriage. Anyhow. Are we surprised that Jelaine had a secret husband? Not really, especially when she was raised not to be seen in public with any of her boyfriends. During the trial, Jelaine's lawyers tried to argue that Jelaine wasn't an Epstein co-conspirator, but rather another one of Epstein's victims. Jelaine knew what she was doing, and she enjoyed the benefits of the life that it afforded her. Allegedly. She recruited countless young women and girls worldwide, knowing they were going to be subjected to horrific sexual abuse. Jelaine was a lot of things, but she wasn't a victim. After a month-long trial, the jury deliberated for five days, and on December 29th, 2021, Jelaine was found guilty of five out of the six charges Six months later, she was sentenced to 20 years in a low-security prison and a $750,000 fine. She will likely be released around 2037, after which she will remain on probation for five years. In March 2023, Jelaine's lawyers argued that either her conviction should be overturned or they should get a new trial because of the plea deal that Epstein made back in 2007. The lawyers claim that Epstein's deal made him and any potential co-conspirators immune from prosecution. Mm. And if this becomes a thing and Jelaine actually gets out early because of it, I will scream. Everybody will hear me just from my own home. Of course. But also, wait a second. I, I thought she wasn't a co-conspirator. I thought she was a victim. Mm, exactly. Mm. You got to pick one. Pick a lane. 
Some may say Jelaine didn't necessarily know what Epstein was doing behind closed doors, but she absolutely did. Everyone who knew him knew what he was doing. Even shitbag Donald Trump told New York Magazine in 2002, quote, I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. He's a lot of fun to be with. It's even said he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. Barf. After disgusting. After Epstein's arrest, Trump tried to walk it back, saying, quote, I had a falling out with him. Haven't spoken to him in 15 years. I was not a fan of his. I can tell you that. Mm. I find 15 years to be very specific that both times, seven years apart, he was like, oh, I've known him 15 years. And suddenly, oh, I haven't talked to him in 15 years. Liar. Uh, please. Yeah. Everyone knew. And how do I know that Jelaine knew? Well, for four, Epstein's 40th birthday in 1993, Jelaine asked a friend to write a special song for Epstein. And she asked the writer to include things about Epstein's love of much younger women and something about how many girls had crushes on him when he was a teacher back in the 80s. Gross. So even if Jelaine didn't help facilitate Epstein's assaults, she absolutely knew about them and turned a blind eye to them for decades. I believe the victims when they say Jelaine was involved. It's unbelievably gross, and I'm glad she was convicted. In conclusion, Robert Maxwell was a media mogul who overextended himself and even stole from his own companies to try and compete with Rupert Murdoch in a one-sided rivalry. But Robert was just the beginning of the fraud and truly despicable things that members of this family would prove to be capable of over the last three decades. And to end this on a quote from Robert Maxwell that did absolutely not age well. Quote, the thing I'd most like to see invented is a way of teaching children and grown-ups the difference between right and wrong. Wow. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm spicy today. Listen, uh, you and me both, baby. Well, yeah. look, let's take one more break. One more break. One more break. Hit the can, grab another drink, and we're going to be right back to wrap it up about the House of Maxwell episode here on True Crime and Cocktails. All right, final clap on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing House of Maxwell. What a journey. What a journey. Yeah, see, my only knowledge of her has been, I watched a documentary that came out a while ago, I think probably one of the first ones, that was just focusing on her and uh, Epstein. And so I didn't know any of this backstory about her family. What a wild ride. And to your point also, how interesting, too, that it's, you know, we came off of uh, the Murdochs and then we're into this other... uh, family of horrors for lack of a better term um just wild just wild uh and it's it's also interesting to me like anyone who's making these business decisions that are just so poor yeah like i I, it feels like i mean not to immediately get into my psychologist hat but i'm like that feels like a narcissism there that it's like oh i know best i got it I know what I'm doing. And it's like, you you really don't, though, because all of these businesses are failing and you seem to be making consistent bad choices. You know, um, you brought up Taron Egerton. Did I ever tell you I saw him on Raya? No kidding. Yeah. And I bypassed and just sent him a message because I was like, I'm going to shoot my shot with him. Oh, Never responded. Mm. Never responded. Don't care for that. Doesn't like a bold lady. Doesn't. Nope. Nope. Doesn't his deserve loss. one then. His loss. Um, and I love that my reaction to, in my head, you said he was on Raya. In my head, I literally went, score. What? You're being taken over by the hockey. Um, I, am. I, am. I love it. Your Russian nesting doll of true crime is one of my favorite things I've ever heard on this show. Just had to say that. I was. Um, very proud and laughed a lot to myself. It's really funny. 
Um, the specific that this man lectured a prima ballerina on how to do a move, I want uh, I, I want to just wring his neck. Uh, again, that's adding to my narcissism potential, uh, again, alleging diagnosis. Um, this death is interesting. I'm not sure what I think about it. There's part of me that thinks he did kill himself, even though, I don't know, it just feels like there th that big meeting that same day, like I could see him being like, this is it. It's the 11th hour. I'm not coming out of this unscathed. Like no one takes me out, but me. Yeah. I'd rather go this way than, um, you know, sit in prison. Cause I don't think he could have handled prison. Also that documentary, it did one of those annoying things where it, it has a minute of information and they drag it out over I hate like it. 20 minutes where you get yep. like tiny pieces because according to that, they made it seem like he was missing for days, weeks. Cause they were like, still no word about Robert. And then it was like 14 hours later. I'm like, it's only been 14 hours. 14 hours is a long time, but that documentary made it seem like a lot longer. And the yeah. whole time I was going, if no bodies found, he absolutely skipped and ran. Yeah. He absolutely faked his death. And is living comfortably somewhere with his Liechtenstein bank account or something. But then they found his body and I was like, ah, never mind that theory then. Yeah. The idea, too, that maybe the crew did hear something, but because they potentially hated him so much, they ignored it. Reminded me of Overboard when they do that with her because she's so <laughs> she's so awful. Right. Thank that they're so like much didn't hear anything. They absolutely um, do. You know what sticks in my head the most about that movie besides Roy, yep. Um, is when uh, she's she's regained her memory. She's back on the boat, and she uses like the side of a table or something to crack open a beer. And she takes a sip, and she's like, "Ooh, this is good." And she looks around, and she's like, "I was wrong. I did something wrong." I have felt that in my life, where I'm like, "Oh my god, what did I do wrong?" But for some reason, that just sticks with me. That she was like, "It was wrong," and I'm like. You're enjoying yourself, Goldie. I love it. You did nothing wrong. I love it. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally, I mean, I also, but I also don't like, again, the crew saying there was no one else on board. I'm like, do we also trust them? Like they could have gotten paid off. And it, again, if they had no love for this, uh, you know, madman, then it, I, they could be keeping a secret. Um, it just doesn't seem like it was a full accident to me. I mean, I know that he does have the pattern of peeing off the side of buildings and boats. So there could be something there, but. I don't know. Also, it just anybody feels... out there that owns a boat, it's not normal to pee yeah. over the side. Like, I... I think it probably is for some people. He was also. I'm not saying I video. would do it, but well, that? I'd like to see you try. <laughs> but the amount of video that it was like paparazzi shots of him swimming around, it was very clear he was nude. Right very clear like yeah. you could see bare ass cheek as he's swimming around in that ocean and all i could think of was did he just walk around the boat naked oh probably gross gross, gross. now was it major general cavendish sumner did i get the last word wrong oh i think it was grosvenor but grosvenor grosvenor yes in the moment definitely major Major General. Because it was you have you have a bit. Don't no. you have didn't don't you have something that uh well the yeah, the that starts major general or major something? Well major general was uh how I met your mother. Right? Didn't they do that? Oh, okay. A bit? Well, I thought you had a bit with someone about that. I don't think I do. Oh, well, either way, it was just such a beautiful title. Major General Cavendish Grosvenor. Like that's like you can't script a better name than that. Right? Yeah. Uh, you and the Pope, you're both ugly and both failed actors. Horror show. True horror show. Yeah. Well, I'm, he didn't name the boat the Lady Anne. Well, oh, yeah, exactly. Um, the fact, again, that then there was another death, that Isabel's third husband killed himself or, or seemingly killed himself or was pushed yeah. off a side of a cliff. Again, what is it with families? Just there's certain families that have these like cycles. You know what I mean? Where it's like. It feels like it's a curse or something, legit. Yeah. Um, this trust fund is fascinating. 
clearly in the Liechtenstein bank for a reason. Absolutely. Um, the same reason why Epstein put his money in the U S Virgin islands. It's the same concept. You're hiding yeah. money essentially. Yeah. Um, the details. Oh yeah. His work release, quote unquote, prison stay. It appalled me too. It blew my mind when I saw that. I'm like, what even is that though? Yeah. I don't even understand how it's a punishment. It's essentially, you just had to sleep in a certain place. You had to be back whatever time, whoever, 6 PM, whatever it is you just, in, until morning. Like, how is that a punishment? It's not. It's like you're being given like a free place to stay. Yep. I I was blown away by that too. I didn't even know that that existed. Um, the details about him and, and Harvard, and I think it was MIT, uh, letting him visit after he was a registered sex offender blew my mind. I did not know that. I literally just wrote down sex offender. Like I'm just, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Why else was he giving money other than to have a reason to go to campus to potentially try and find young women? Like it's, it's very obvious. Yep. And he probably thought in his own mind, he had, he was a changed man and he was doing good because he was going for girls that were over 18. I bet you any money that was a thought process for him. Oh, I'm sure of it. Gross. Piece so of gross. shit. Um, the hyoid bone broken. There's another case that we talked about that in, and I can't remember which one it was. You're the one that brought it up because I you was. said hy hyoid, hyoid boing. Boing? Hyoid bone. Yes. There we go. Yes. You said it first. I literally have had half this drink. Well, look, you're not a bone owner. <laughs> you're not a bone owner. I, <laughs> I am not. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Somebody's going to tell us. I can't remember what it was, but I do. I just, I was like, immediately I had that like sense memory of like, I said that I brought that up before. You did. What one was it? Um, the islands listed for 125 million. They sold for 60 million. Wow. I just don't think there's enough cleansing crystals and, and different things that we could uh, incense and whatnot to, to cleanse the energy off that but, but something, anything that's been nicknamed pedophile Island. I don't know if that's a great investment. Just going to put it out there. No, um, I mean, that's how they got it for half the price. Exactly. But again, but, I'm like, there's a, there's a, there's a heaviness to that place. I bet just in the air. Yeah. Yeah. And also how much of that do you have to like tear down and rebuild? Well, you should all of it, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, the tinfoil on the phone. I just wanted to say mm -hmm. shout out to Canadian band Limlifter with hit single tinfoil. Anytime I hear the word tinfoil, I think of that song. Any time. That's Fun nice. fact for the listeners who don't know, two of the members of Age of Electric are in Limlifter. There you go. Yeah. And I screamed when, when <laughs> I met them via Zoom. Yep. Yep. I can't really think about it. It was beautiful. Can't. It was beautiful. Um... Now, you said she pled not guilty, her bail was denied, and then my instinct, as though I'm a native New Yorker, was to go, <laughs> she go to Rikers? What's wrong with me? <laughs> she probably didn't go to Rikers. You probably don't even know where she went, but I'm just saying, that was my instinct. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She go to Rikers? What is- Well, I, I know she's in anymore. Florida. Well, there you go. But she Which was a- Which something I will bring up. In the Patreon bonus that we were recording. Oh, this. okay. So yeah. wait a second. So she wasn't taken in in New York? Uh, I think she was, but she is okay. currently incarcerated in That's Florida. fine. I just feel better because I was like, did I make something up? Did I just make something up? Oh, I. But the, it's possible she went to Rikers originally, but she got sentenced yeah. to a low security. Of course. Well, there you go. So. She's probably out, out and about getting her Starbucks in the daytime. Um. Now, the, the the legal defense that she was a victim just made me immediately think of Carla Homolka uh, and Paul Bernardo yep. because that was that whole case as well. She signs that deal. They find out, oh, no, no, no. She was very involved. She was in a very similar sense, actually. I mean, the big difference between those two cases is that Bernardo and Homolka killed their victims or their victims died. Um, one of them died accidentally. Obviously, Carla Homolka's own sister um but uh cho choking on the vomit of the drugs they used for her to uh pass out so the only difference to me is that with uh Gislaine and epstein um 
she was the one who was kind of like actively seeking out all these women and bringing them to him, which is so wild. The fact, again, that it was like, well, you'll learn to fly the helicopter to helicopter us back and forth to the mainland. It's just, I mean, to be in that woman's head, and I agree with you, I think psychologist hat, this is all about replacing her father and wanting to kind of emulate that relationship, what have you, but it is just wild that she took it as far as she did and was willing 100%. to. Um, I mean, it's it says a lot, not that I'm suggesting that women are incapable of crimes, I'm obviously not, but it's a lot. For, you just don't hear a ton of stories about like women finding 13, 14 year old girls to bring to their friend to have sex with. Like, yes, it happens. I, I, unfortunately, and it's disgusting and, and it's awful. Um, but I just think for me, it's always just that little bit more uh, disarming when again, you just hear about a woman doing the, the preying upon. Um, it just, yeah, it unsettles me, obviously. Yes. Uh, the, I'm curious about what the legal precedence is with this co-conspirator claim. They're saying that that his deal would then also like be an umbrella deal to to extend to her. I don't know about that. Maybe. Um, but again, I would be very curious if we have any lawyers listening. Can you imagine? Uh, I'm just curious if there is any legal precedence for that, because that feels like a bit of a stretch to me. But maybe I'm wrong. You never know. I don't know if it did say co-conspirator. and But did I, it say that in the original deal or were they just saying, oh, it was implied? I think they're saying it was in the original deal. But again, how the fuck they also get that? That's like, weird. I just will never understand why they thought what he was getting as a deal was it was like, this is great. Perfect. Take the oh. we'll take that deal. It's like, what were you getting? Oh wait, thirteen that, that, months corruption in prison. Corruption. Stop there, it. there is, there is in, in the corruption. There's just no way he paid them off, or he paid somebody off, or he had relationships with somebody. Yeah, full stop. Like there's just no way. It's, it's again, it's, it's the sad story that I feel like we hear different variations of on this show so often, which is just that money can buy you freedom. Money can buy you less jail time money can buy you all of the above you know so that's that's i think it's just that plain and simple you had to have been friends with somebody yeah it sounds right um but listen those are all my thoughts i mean again what a true horror show but a fascinating story again when you hear top to bottom about her family history i'm always it was the same for me with like army hammer and hearing like how again there's these patterns throughout these generations within these families there's these patterns that emerge of behavior of of bad luck or misfortune. Like, it's just interesting to me to see how that goes. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, not every single one of these Maxwell family members was a pile of trash. We don't know what the brothers did, how much they knew about the money being missing. Um, sure, one of them later got caught taking money from another company. I'm sure those things are unrelated. Um, but I just, oh God, what are, I'm grossed out mm -hmm. by so many things. Uh, also, uh, Jelaine's siblings, most of them still super supportive of her. That's yeah. always interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And I know that they think she's innocent and all of that, but I'm like, do you really think that though? Do you yeah. really? When you look at it all, isn't there a part of you that's thinking, I bet they meow on the phone together. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which again, I'll never let that go because that's fucking weird. It's and interesting that that was their like little cutesy bit that they did with one another and that it continued into adulthood. And also, by the way, it feels like there's a difference between like, meow meow and then they move on and like having full conversations and meowing that to yep. me is where it gets into like oh what's up but i immediately thought <laughs> do they had a code was it a secret code interesting was, first thing that came into my mind i was like is it so many meows means 
I mean, I know now I sound like a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist, but I just was like, is there tin something foil on your phone? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but I was like, is there something else there? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's more than possible. I mean, is it, was that her way of saying just a heads up, someone's in the room with me, just a heads up, this is being recorded or whatever, but he was recording everything. Like he, he had bugs in so many places because he couldn't stand not knowing. And it's just, I get that once you have certain properties and you make a name for yourself, banks will fall all over themselves and give you money. Yeah. But then I think of like lovely young people who just want to like buy a house. Yep. And they're like, absolutely not. But yet you allowed him to get billions of dollars in debt. Mm-hmm. And you were like, he's good for it. Spun on. He's not. He was absolutely not good for it. No. And I'm just so grossed out. Again, I, I have spent a lot of time, especially saying to you I, in the last few weeks where I'm like, how is it another entitled rich old man? How? And mm -hmm. the one I'm doing now, same. <laughs> so it's just, it just feels like, how are there so many of these? Well, the idea of how many more there are, I can't. We haven't even scratched the surface. Oh, no. I'm I'm horrified by all of it. I also did not know about her family. I had heard about him or her, of course, and I had heard all this when everything came out with Epstein, but I had no idea that it's like, oh, there was also a thing with her father. But the joke is what taught me about it was the Tetris movie because there is a guy who plays Robert Maxwell in the movie. And at the end, it tells you like a little blurb about what happened to them or whatever. And it commented about like, he stole all this money and then he mysteriously died. And I was like, holy shit. And it's like, and his daughter is her. And I just went, oh my God, should I do an episode about this guy or about the family? And then I found out about the documentary and I'm like, I guess I will. That's so funny. So well done, Tetris movie. Like, well, and well done, you. Well done, you. Because as always, Christy Oxborough, you never cease to bring the goods. It's it's an embarrassment of riches. We're too lucky to have you in our lives. And I thank you for your work as always. Oh, God. I'm the lucky one. Hell no. I'll say it. Hell no. And we thank you, dear listeners, for being with us on this journey. We so appreciate your support and love. Uh, if you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, at Twitter, at Not Detectives. And of course, if you'd like some bonus episodes, patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails is the place to learn all about that over there. It's a subscription-based service. We have a lot of fun. Check it out. And the only place, of course, for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is truecrewmerch.com so check that out as well if you're interested christy do you want to tell the people about next week's episode do you want to because it's yours me <laughs> me say the episode yeah on the next true crime and cocktails joe francis girls gone wild that's that right dear listeners i am fired up again you're talking about a, you were talking about privileged white men well yep. buckle in because we got another big one coming and i gotta tell you something there's so much about him and that i had no idea about that is truly shocking i'm very excited to bring this case to all of you hey well that's yeah. exciting to me and i'll say it that was easily your best on the next oh thank you oozed sex appeal like if you want to take a snippet of that and add that to your message on raya oh Oh, I, I deleted Raya. I, uh, it just sucked my will to live, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know what? Yeah. Maybe I should sample that in my next song. That's how it starts out on the next Boy. and then the music kicks in. Right. I like that a lot. I like it too. Uh, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, doll and Kearns brothers. Oh, good night to the boys.